In this video, I'm going to speak about the transient response for uh, second order systems. So I will talk about the the performance metrics we use to quantify the transient performance for second order systems. So in the previous video, I talked about how to compute the output for a second order system given uh, input. For example, given an input uh, such as a step input. So I talk about the the type of response we typically can see for different type of damping factors. So if you remember, here's a recap of what we talked about last time. So we talk about given a second order system, okay, which is given by this Wn uh, squared divided by s squared plus two theta Wns plus Wn squared, and given certain input u sub t, which you say which is the step input over here, and we want to compute with the output. So in the previous video, I talk about the specific form for the y, the y sub t. Okay, so this theta is called a damping factor. So I actually talk about uh, several different cases. One is a uh, one is a under damping, one is critical damping, one is over damping, one is no damping. Okay, so for uh, uh, for here I won't talk about a no damping because for the no damping case you will see oscillation all the time. So there's no uh, steady state. So we don't talk about a transient performance for this case. So here for this case we say no transient performance. So we don't talk about transient performance for this case. Okay. So that means we're going to focus on the transient performance for three uh, cases over here. One is an under damping, when theta is between 0 and 1. Uh, critical damping, when theta is 1. And over damping, when theta is greater than 1. So here I'm, I'm giving you a, 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 a a simple part of what is our, what is a YT and with respect to different damping factors. One is uh, the green one means the damping factor between zero and one. So the, the typical response the output of the Y sub T is given by this line. So you see it's going up really fast and going down, up and down, and then gradually uh, reach the steady state, which is one. Okay. So when it, it comes to the second case, when theta is one, called critical damping. Well, the system response looks like it's going up and then approaches this uh, steady state, which is also one. When theta is greater than one, it's got over damping, so it still approaches the steady state, which is one, but it's much slower because you have damping factors higher than one. So this is what we can see visually in terms of the transient performance. They all reach the steady state of one, which is the, the input I gave. However, the weight and how it reaches the Reach the before the uh, reach the state state how the the system respond can be dramatically different. Okay, so now let's talk about what is the transient performance for second order systems. So here I'm going to give a the re, re plot over here. So make it a little bit larger. You can see over here. So a little bit messy over here, but I'm going to explain what's going to happen. Okay, so uh, for the transient performance for second order system, we have a number of factors that are used to quantify the transient performance. The first one is called uh, rising time. Okay, the rising time. I'm going to emphasize it called rising time. This is the first metric using to quantify the transient performance for second order system. So the rising time for uh, under damping and the critical over damping. We have different cases. This is case one. You can see. So which is talking about for under damping case, we have a definition of rising time. For case two. Which apply to critical damping or over damping, we have a new definition of the rising time. They're different. They're not. They're not the same. Uh, same. Uh, they not. They're defined in a different way. So for under damping, the critical, the rising time is a time from zero percent to one hundred percent, one hundred percent of the final steady state. As we know, the final steady state here, y sub t, is equal to u sub t, which is one. Okay. Okay, steady state is one. It's the same as input. Assuming that my input is a, a unit step input. Okay, so that's time. So we, if I draw it over here, so the rise time for I mean the blue line represents under damping. So you see it's going uh, going up and then going down, up and down, up and down. The steady state uh, reaches steady state at one. Okay, so the rising time is from starting point zero to when it reaches one hundred percent, which means because steady is one when you reach one. So this is the TR for my uh, under damping case. Okay, so for critical or over damping case, the rising time is defined as time 
from 10% to 90% of the final steady state. Okay, so if I take this one, the overdamping as example, so the time TR is the 10 time 10%. So this is 10%. This is 2 and 2, 90%. So this is pretty much like 10% time 1, right? And this is 90% time 1. So the time it, reaches, uh, it takes for the system to move from 10% of final state state to 90% of final state, that's defined as rising time for for critical damping or over damping. Okay. The second one, uh, the second one is, uh, the metric is called peak time. The peak time here only applies to here. Make sure that only applies to end damping case. The peak time means is a time that reaches a maximum uh, state. So this is the time that the maximum state is reached. So it reaches the maximum. You can see if you do it over here. You go up, 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 and start going down, and going down, going up, going down again. You basically say the first point start to move from move from going up to going down. This point is my uh, peak point because anyone anyone after that will be smaller than this. Okay, so this is a peak time. Okay, um, peak time for end damping. So peak time is also can be calculated. The peak time is is given by pi divided by wn square root of 1 minus theta squared. Okay, so that's so analytically how we compute the peak time. Okay. So the next uh, metric is called settling time. So settling time is the time after which the state is always within 2% error of the final state state. So this one applies to all cases for under damping, critical damping, and over damping that apply to all different cases. So it's a time for it takes to which when it's within a small range because let's say the final steady state is, is use, use of t is 1 so what this uh, what this uh, certain time is if I give a small bound which is let's use a different color um, use this color so if you're within if I draw a very tiny tiny bound this is plus or minus 1 so this is a lower bound this is bound. so this is uh, 102 percent of my use of t which is 1 okay this is 98 percent time 1 if you draw a line or you get a very little bound bound okay so once the system the y sub t stay and won't move out of this little bound the earliest time it start not moving out of this bound is called the the settling time okay so that's the definition of uh, uh, the settling time. So the settling time can be roughly computed as four divided by theta times uh, uh, wn. So this is the way this you can have a under damping, you can have an over damping, you can have a critical damping. Okay. So the last one, the last, uh, the, the 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 next one, the metric is called overshoot, which also only applies to uh, under damping. Overshoot means you know how much higher you can you can rise above the you know the steady state uh, steady state. For example, this only applies to the uh, under damping uh, because for critical damping and for over damping you don't have overshoot because it never reach above this uh, steady state. Only for the under damping it can shoot up and then go down up and down. Then so this is the the maximum. Uh, uh, the maximum values that go above this this uh, this value this uh, steady state that's called the uh, uh, that's called the overshoot. So overshoot is uh, actually using the called relative. It's relative with respect to the 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 final steady state. For example, this uh, overshoot is defined as y at tp. Tp is called the peak time. So what is the state as the peak time minus y bar y bar is called a final state state in this case is one for in the figure right so minus this value and divide by this value the final state state that's called overshoot okay so overshoot for example if my y bar is 10 the state is 10 ytp the maximum uh, the the state uh, the y output as the peak time is 15 so and my, my mp is just 0 0.5 because you can do this one is 15 minus 10 divided by 10, so which is just giving me 0 0.5. So 
So generally, this MP, if I give you already give you a, a second order system including the damping factor, including WN, now this this uh, overshoot can be uh, computed this way. MP is just e to the minus pi theta divided by square root of one minus theta, um, one minus theta squared. Okay, so this is all in my uh, exponential of this e e to that value. Okay, you can see this is a e to this value. Okay. So if I give you theta and uh, give you uh, pi and uh, as give you theta, you should be able to compute the the, the overshoot. Okay, it has it is not related to W N. You actually don't have care about this W N. Okay, so the next one is called a percentage overshoot. The only difference between the overshoot and percentage you, you calculate the over you overshoot using percentage. So you basically time your your overshoot time one hundred and of course using percentage you it's the, the percentage overshoot. So this is pretty much derived from and should and as from the overshoot. So this also only applies to under and damping. Okay. So that's pretty much all the all the all the metric we're using to quantify the the transient performance for second order system. Okay, rising time and peak time, settling time, this I went here, this is for all. Okay. And then is over overshoot and uh, percentage overshoot. So those are the metrics we use to quantify the the second order system. So w when I give you a second order system, you can actually compute those uh, those uh, those uh, uh, those metrics. So you can sort of see this is important because if I give example of why those metrics are reasonable. Let's say for example, if I want to drive a car, I want to let's say I want to drive a car. So I have a motor lane car. Okay, motor lane. So I'm driving a car. Okay. It's moving forward, for example. Okay, excuse my, my poor drawing of this car. If I want to change the lane to this lane, okay, I want to control. Assuming, of course, it's a second order system. Maybe the actual system can be different. Let's assume it's a second order system. The way we're looking at this one is you want to change the lane to the to this lane as fast as possible, right? Not overshooting because if overshooting too much, you go overshooting to the next. So this lane is not it's not good, right? So that's why we're looking at the the. The overshooting definitely is one factor that we care about. Also, the rising time is like how much time from the current lane that I can move completely to the next lane, right? Because I want to care about to move slowly, yes, yeah, so smoothly, okay, and also probably quickly. If I move so slow and it's it's not safe, okay. Of course, I also talk about settling time because it, once I move to the lane, I don't want to move out. I want to go out, uh, move, I take a lot of time to settle down in the lane. So that's also the uh, why certain time is important. So this also applies to many different cases when you know we talk about the performance for you know for a given consumer system, uh, which are quantity, which are characterized by the second order system. Okay, so uh, now let's go uh, to some examples. See, okay, once we have this uh, uh, metrics, so in terms of control design, not only we want to control design to reach a goal uh, in terms of steady state, but also we want to Design our control algorithm such that some transient performance can be met. Okay, let's say give a very simple examples about some example about how you know some of the parameters can be important in the control design. Okay, so let's see if I give you a uh, some uh, sort of very simple system, a uh, uh, negative feedback control system. Okay, so I have negative uh, unit negative uh, unit uh, negative feedback, and the original system is given by. K divided by S and S plus one. I have a unit feedback. Okay, assuming here K is positive, of course. Okay, so um, we want to see how this K will affect my, you know, the if it's under damping, over damping, uh, what kind of system we have? Because for different type of system, will give you different, give me different uh, performance. So I sort of can write this one in a closed loop system. So you use the the block diagram, okay, you can just simplify this, this uh, original one as a simple one, and this is just my transfer function, okay? So by doing the block diagram, and because this is the negative feedback, you can just f try to figure out what is the transfer function right here. So this is k over s, s plus 1, divide by 1 plus k over s, s plus 1. Okay, now you have you know, this is just the value we get over here. Okay, once we have that one, we have to write this one in a form that is similar to what we have showing over here, okay? The same format. Okay, let's do some change. Because I want to have something like this. I want to have something divided s squared plus 2 t to w and s plus w and squared, right? So apparently here, I have, what I have here is my k 
should be wn squared, right? Which means wn should be square root of k, okay? And also the parameter here is 1, okay? So which means 2 theta wn should be equal to 1, which means the theta should be 1 over 2 square root of k. Okay, so this is what we calculate about this value. So you can sort of see this one becomes wn squared divided by s squared plus 2 theta wn s plus wn squared, which is the same. This one can be written as this if wn is square root of k and theta is 1 divided by 2 square root of k. So that would be equivalent. That would be equivalent if we define this way. So this work will satisfy the form we need to analyze, uh, you know, the second order system. Okay. Now we can set a, sort of say, hey, we can just try to see what, uh, you know, if I select give a value of k, I can check if it's under damping, crit damping, over damping, or so on and so forth. So when I do the calculation, so because I, uh, what I want to do, because I want to, if theta, I know if theta is between 0 and 1, it's under damping. So when you calculate this one, when k is greater than 1 over 4, 1 over 4, do you have an end damping? Credit damping with theta is exactly equal to 1, so k is just 1 over 4. Uh, over damping is k is just between 0 and 1 over 4. Okay, that's then you can see how k, how the selection of k will uh, affect the system performance because if you have an under damping, critical damping, or over damping, uh, the actual start, the actual performance will be different. Okay. For example, if I want to say I want my percentage overshoot, you know, of course, it's under damping case should be less than fifty percent, which means I don't want my system to go over fifty percent. Uh, overshoot should be more than fifty over my steady state. Okay. So you sort of can see, well, if I say because of my percentage overshoot is computed by 1% time e to the minus pi uh, theta and divided by 1 over theta squared, for example, so on and so forth. It's less than 50%, right? So do this one, you can just do the calculation. This one should be less one than 50%, which means this guy's value should be less than 1 half. And if I do some more calculation, I can tell you my theta should be, uh, should be, Critical theta should be 0 0.095, okay, which means the theta should be, if I go back to check the, uh, the relation between theta and uh, k, so k should be 2.3. The critical value should be 2.3, which means you actually want a larger one and the damping, right, because the greater than, the greater than that one, right? So you actually want to have a, a less, it should be less than this value to k is 2.3, otherwise, uh, uh, Otherwise, because you want to see my k is less than 0 uh, 2.3 to make sure you are less than 50% overshoot, okay? Because uh, you're, the, the, once the k, the smaller the k is the better because once k is, is one fourth, you have critical damping. When k is uh, less than one fourth, it's over damping. That's why you want to damp more. So this one's smaller, the you damp more, basically, right? So which means you, you, you move from, correct? So if I draw it over here, if I draw a picture of what's happening, let's see, this is this is a k value. So if I have k is, let's see, draw over here, is, this is uh, one fourth. So, so if I draw a line over here, so this is the under damping on this side. This is the under damping, just use under, and this line is critical. And this side is over. So you actually want to move your k value smaller so you can get the more damping. Okay, then which means you don't have you have less overshoot. Okay. Okay, so next question, what if I have you know sort of a u sub t which is t? I don't have just step input. I have a, a ramp in, I have a input is a, a ramp input. Okay, what's gonna happen? You can sort of do the same way as I mentioned, as I, defy, uh, as I did before, because in the previous one I talked about how to compute it. You also have to compute what's the actual value of y sub t given this input. So in the previous video I talked about, I don't talk about the detail about how to compute it, but you can follow the same uh, procedure to compute y sub t. Uh, so generally speaking, you can do this one. You can do the first computer, what is uh, the output in the s domain, 
by uh, using the trans function over here as well as my input is one over s squared and then you do the inverse Laplace transform of uh, my y of s which is you do the use the partial flex expansion to compute this is use partial flex expansion to compute the, to divide, uh, to rewrite this one into several different components and the, it's a sum of the different components and then use the linear property you can sort of figure out the uh, you can sort of figure divide into different cases. So here, um, you can compute what's the a and b and this actual values are over here. So I don't want to talk, talk too much about detail, but this is the uh, this is the idea I talk about in the partial flex expansion. If you don't know how to compute this a and b and c and d values, you can go to my video on the partial flex expansion part to figure out the a and b and the c and d. So actually, when you once you figure out what is the a and b and the c and d, you actually can compute what is the y sub t here. So y sub t is t minus 2 theta divided by w plus so on and so forth. But I, don't, I just want to ignore over here. This one can be a little bit more complicated. Okay, uh, I don't want to talk about too much about it. So it's sort of e something times e to the minus something t times cosine w and t plus something times e some uh, some value of w t. So this one, the nice thing for this one is this one will be this value over here, this value here, they're all, they're all positive, so which means this one will drive this to zero, which means eventually the statistics only drive by this value. Okay, it just, you, eventually you only these two terms matter. These two matter do do not matter. Okay, so at least I can see the final state state error is if I compute the limit of you don't, we don't have final state state because this limit this guy will drive the y equal to infinity. However, the state state error does exist. If you do the limit of t equal to infinity y t minus the use of t because this t will cancel out, so the limit will be just two negative 2 theta w. So you do have sort of, you can sort of see, yeah, my system can, the difference, although my YST does not track my use of t very accurately for the ramp input over here, but it does give me a constant value. On the other side, for the second order system I mentioned before, like right over here, if I give a step input, my error is always zero, right? It stays error because it can always reach the one. It doesn't matter, you know, what the theta we have unless it's, uh, it's no damping. If there's some damping, it's always go to the same, which means the steady state error is zero. If I do a summary over here, so uh, if I have um, the ramp input, my steady state error is constant, sort of, so to speak. Now, if like right here, if use of t is one, so I have the limit of t go to infinity y sub t minus u sub t will go to will be zero, right? Unless it's no damping, okay? This is for under critical and and over damping. They all should be should go to zero, which means you have zero test the error. But for the for the ramp, we do have an error, but the error is too constant, so it's okay. So this one, uh, you know, by looking at this one, we, we sort of have a question. So what system will yield a zero state state error, okay? So which means, yeah, for certain system, yeah, you can give it a zero state state error. For certain system, it does not give us a certain state state, state error. So we want to look at, you know, what system will give us a, a zero state state error. So this is some of the problem you can, we can sort of see. We can also go back to the first order system to see what's happening. So first order system, we can see, first order system, this is the first order system. If I give a step input, the steady state typically is not zero. It's not zero, it's, but it's a constant. However, if I for the similar state, in, uh, the, the step input, unit step input, for second order system, it does give me a zero steady state error. It looks like the second order system and it's better than the first order system in terms of the Providing the the steady the zero steady state error reducing the steady state error okay, so we want to give give you a brief you know uh, overview about what has been started okay I won't talk about too much detail about why that's the case, but this is what has been started and what the general conclusion would be okay I'll talk about it in the next. So typically we we'll talk about you know when we talk about a system we talk about the type the input I talk about type. The type of input is given by defined by this. So if I give you a step input, remember for the time domain, I said, you know, for giving use of t for giving control input, I can always write in using the 
using the uh, tail expansion, right? Write this as something like what, something a plus b t plus c t squared plus so on and so forth. You sort of can see this will <coughs> determine the different inter uh, input type. So you can sort of consider this one is a times one, you write it as a times one. So a constant is a type zero input. As I write over here, type zero input. So t will be type one, t squared will be type two. So this will be type one, type one, one, so on and so forth. And t squared will be just type two input. Okay? Right, so I say the ut is one, the in step, unit step is type of zero, okay? Now I also have a definition of a type of system. So this is the type of the input, okay? Also type of system, okay? I say, oh, I just give the word called system type. Uh, type star of system. So what does the type of system mean, okay? The type of system does, is not mean by the original uh, by the the closed loop system, it is, is uh, the the structure function for the system. It is given by this. This is how define the the type of system. The type of system talks about if I write a system as unit unit uh, state feedback. It actually is also negative unit state feedback. And what is my system? What is the the s the number of s appears in the the system part? So this is my system, basically, right? So assume I have a unit, unit negative feedback. Okay. So the number of s appears in the system part determines the system type. For example, if this is k divided by s s plus one in my system with a ne unit negative feedback. So this is called type one system because this is s to the power of one. So this is type one. Now, if I give on the other side, if I give you still a unit a negative feedback system, and my system give by k divided s squared plus plus one, this is called type zero system because I cannot write this one as s times something. Right? It doesn't uh, it doesn't hold true. Right? It, you can sort of see this is s zero times s squared plus s plus one. So because this is zero, the maximum we can have, right? So this is called type zero system, okay? So similarly, if I look at this one, if I look at this one, this one over s plus tau is something like this. It's k over s plus one, for example. This is called type zero system because this is like s zero s plus, uh, I should say this one can be written as s zero times s plus one, right? Because s zero is one. So this is type zero. You don't have uh, a type one system, okay? So what happens is, what happens is you could have, of course, if I have this one is, if I replace this one by k over s, let's see, now this is type one, type one system. Okay, so that's why I had to find this, the type of system. So the interesting is there's a, a strong correlation between the type of input and the type of, of system in terms of the steady state error. Okay, that's uh, what is the uh, what is the uh, found in terms of relationship. How we can you know uh, quantify, kind of figure out the general uh, property for the steady state error for different type of input and different type of uh, system. Okay. All right. So um, <clears throat> so I don't want to talk too much of it. So for this one, if I give this one, you sort of can see write this one as a steady state as a closed loop system. You can simplify using the transfer yeah, the block diagram. You write this one. Part as a trans uh, as a trans function y sub t. You see, when k is greater than positive or unit t, this does not yield a steady state error, right? Because it, this is type of one. You can also check this does not yield because if you check the y sub s given this input, let's say you give a steady uh, u sub t, which is one. You can sort of verify why the system type zero system was not give would not give you a zero steady state error because you can. Let's say if this is my system, I can compute the closed loop transfer function, and I can compute the output is one of s, one of s, time k s plus one. This is my transfer function. If the limit of this guy is the limit of the, because this one, assume this is status stable, the limit of this guy is limit of s goes zero, s time y s. This give me replace s by one, okay, because this s will cancel out, right? So it's limit s goes zero k over s 
plus k plus 1. This is k divided by k plus 1. This definitely is not equal to 1. So this one is not uh, the, which means the steady state. Error is not equal to 0. That's because this is type 0 system. However, if I do this one as a type, I change this one to type 0 is 1 over s. Sort of uh, 1 over s, which means I don't have this plus 1 anymore, okay? I don't have the plus 1 anymore. You can say this is k over k, this is 1. So this is type 1. So we have 0 states to the error, okay? Which means here is, you don't have this value 1 anymore, right? This don't have, so this will be k over k is 1. So it have 0 states to the error, okay? So similarly for type 1 input, if I have the type 1, this is k, user t, t is type 1 system. And if I have this uh, unit negative feedback and my system given by 1 over s squared plus s plus 1 plus s plus 2. So this is type 2 system. Okay. I don't have to calculate. I can tell you that this is 0. Okay. The state state will be 0. Okay. So the general system, system time is defined as the order of the poles of the system g sub s at s is 0 in the unit negative feedback system. So if I have a unit negative feedback system, so the order of the poles of the system g sub s at s is 0, which means if I g sub s is numerator and denominator, so your denominator should have, your denominator should have s to some power, it's s2, and times something over here, you should have two poles over here, you, then your, your system order will be 2, okay? System, uh, system type will be 2, okay? So now here I want to emphasize system time type is not equal to system order. So system time type is as what I defined. The system order is uh, let's say if I give you the same as I do over here, let's say is one over s squared s plus one s plus two. Okay, so what is the system order? This system order is not a 2, although the system time is 2. System order is, you can write this as s squared. This is s squared plus 3s plus 2, okay, which is 1 over s fourth plus 3s cubed plus 2s squared. So this is the highest power of this guy. The highest power of the s determine the system order. So this order will be just Four in this case, okay. So system order is four of this one, but system time is two. Okay, so they are different. Okay, so now let's talk about so like like I mentioned before, the input type can be zero, one, and two, and and two, and depending on you can sort of see this is the system input type. Uh, input type is u t is t to the n. So this n is this type n. Basically, you can say this is type n. So t0 is 1, so this is type 0. t to the 1 is type 1, t to the n is type n. So that's the difference. This is the, the, the general input type. So for the different type of, of course, for G sub S, I could also have different type of input, okay? A different system, right? Different system type. For example, if I give the unit negative feedback, if G sub S here is 1 over S, S plus 2, so this is type 1. If G S is 1 over S squared times S plus 2, this is type 2. If GSS is 1 over the, let's write over here, 1 over S, S squared times S plus 1, times S plus 2, times S plus 3, times 4, you still have time. doesn't matter how many you have over here, you still have system type 2, okay? That's the next time of S I have over here in the denominator. That defines the system order, okay? But like I said, this the order of the system will be different. Okay, I already explained over here. So this is the same explaining what is the the order, the system order and system time they're different. Okay. So let's see talk about what is the outcome uh, when we talk about the steady state error in terms of different type of input and different type of system. Okay, so this is what general we can we can conclude. Okay, so the if I draw this line, this line. So this is my system type. So this is this a this vertical line talk about the system type. So system zero, system one, system type, two system, so on and so forth. And this uh, uh, horizontal line represents the input time. So input zero, which means here, I will write here, this is ut is uh, one, this for example. You could also say ut is two, doesn't matter, you see constant, it's not constant, okay. ut is t and ut is t squared, it's 
uh, type one, uh, input type one, input type two, input type three. So I draw a line right over here. So if you have the same input time and system system time, okay, which means you have a constant steady state of anything around the the the, the, the diagonal part. This gives you a constant state, which means the system time zero is like, for example, one over uh, s plus one over tau. Is I mean the system time zero, right? And of course, my input is zero. This is what exactly what I mentioned over here. So if I have the system time zero, time zero, and also my uh, the system time zero and the input time zero, so you have a constant steady state error. Okay, this is similar for the second order system, right? The the second order system. Okay, the input is type is one, and my system type is. Uh, it's also because okay, this one can be written as a unit feedback with a type one. So this one can be written as um, unit feedback plus this. You can see this is uh, what I see is uh, uh, wn squared over s squared. Make sure I know how to two c the wn s. Right. This is a unit negative feedback. Okay. This is u sub t. This is a, you can write this as unit f uh, feedback form. And this one, of course, if you do the negative feedback, you can rewrite this as this one. And here, this one can be written is equivalent written as w n squared, and this is s time n squared plus two theta w n. Okay. That's why this is this is. System type is one, type one system. This is our type zero system. You should write a system into a unit next feedback and then to check what is your, the G surface that we have over here. That determines your system time. It's not the the closed loop system, transfer function of closed system that determines the system time. Okay. So for this one, as we can see over here, the steady state error is a constant. So which means is exactly what I showed over here. So if you have a system type, uh, the system time is one, and input time is one, we have a constant steady state error. Uh, similarly, if I have system time two and unit time, uh, input time is also two, we also have a constant steady state error. And anything below, okay, uh, below the upper triangle is a lower triangle, then all the, uh, the all the steady state error is zero. So right over here is right below this one is a steady state error zero, which means. If I have the system type is one, unit is that input type is uh, is one is zero. For example, st unit type input is type is zero, and for the second order system I mentioned, it, because it's, it's system type is one, so the steady state error is always zero. Similarly, for the system type is two and the unit step, uh, for the unit step input because the type is one, the type is zero, so the steady state error is also zero. So for the for the for the input type is uh, one and my system type is Two, the the state state error is also zero. Okay, so that's what the what we can say for the lower triangle part, uh, corner part. For the upper part, we can see the error be infinity. It will be infinity. Means there's no state state error. Okay, so that's what we can see about different uh, system uh, uh, for different type of system and different type of input. What we can see about the the state state error.